With the success of Flight 5 just two weeks ago, SpaceX is wasting no time pushing forward with the Starship program, as Booster 13 immediately begins its test campaign at the launch site. Construction continues on the new launch tower and launch mount, and so much more. Now let's dig into this week's update. Starting off this week, in the early hours of Friday morning, the recently delivered and assembled second Block 2 lifting jig was picked up in the ring yard and moved into Mega Bay 2. Later that morning, the cable chain for the new launch tower, along with the two new subcoolers, which had been sitting at the Sanchez site, were rolled out onto Highway 4 and began moving towards the launch complex. After losing some construction time due to last week's launch, SpaceX looked anxious to get back to work on the new pad. That afternoon, the door on the nose cone hall end of Star Factory opened and Test Tank 16 rolled back out of the building. The article then headed between the mega bays on its way to the rocket garden. It's not yet clear if the tank was in Star Factory for inspections or if it received any work or upgrades in anticipation of additional testing. A few hours later, two empty Raptor carts were seen moving from the Raptor's nest over to Star Factory. Both carts were moved with a forklift instead of under their own power. This could indicate that they are being taken there for repair work. That evening, the chopsticks were closed and returned to the base of the tower, following just over a day in the open maintenance position. In the early hours of Saturday morning, a concrete pump truck unfurled its boom near the base of the new launch tower at the western pad. The pump saw steady work as crews placed the new concrete in the area of the flame trench for this new pad. Around 8.30, the pump packed up and departed the site. A little later, the boom on the LR-11000 crane, which has been raised just a few days prior, was lowered back to the ground for unknown reasons. Whatever those reasons were, less than six hours later, the crane once again raised its boom back into the air. And once it was back up, the crane slewed slightly as it prepared for work in the near future. What that work would be was hinted at just a half hour later. The recently delivered cable chain was moved across the back of the launch complex and towards the base of the new launch tower. A short time later, an SPMT left the launch site through the D1 gate and began rolling up Highway 4 towards the production facilities. A little less than a half hour after that, it turned into the build site through the main ring yard gate and disappeared between High Bay and Mega Bay 1. That night, the SPMT reappeared in the ring yard area and headed back out of the same gate as it moved on from its mysterious task between the bays and looked for its next job. A short time later, a truck pulled into the ring yard and headed between High Bay and Mega Bay 1, carrying a small shipping container. Fifteen minutes later, an SPMT followed the truck carrying two additional containers. A few hours later, a short SPMT arrived carrying a fourth container and headed the same way. Early on Sunday, a booster load spreader was carried out of Mega Bay 1 by forklift and driven around the far side of the building towards the Sanchez site. As the sun rose over Starbase, SpaceX's LR-11000 began moving again as it got into position for its lift. The crane lowered its auxiliary hook, which was then connected to the end of the cable chain. After some initial help from a smaller crane to get the chain uncoiled and in the air, the SpaceX crane completed the lift and installed the latest hardware on the new launch tower. That night, the second of the current generation of booster transport stand emerged from the Sanchez site, finally completed and ready for work after over a year of construction. The stand was brought into the ring yard area and parked. Before dawn on Monday, Ship 34's common dome section was rolled out of Star Factory. It was then taken straight into Mega Bay 2 to be joined with the already stacked upper half of the second V2 Starship. A little later, down at the launch complex, a voice was heard over the PA system warning of loud venting for a blowdown from the booster quick disconnect. SpaceX appears to be moving quickly with any repairs and validation testing to prepare for the next launch. Shortly before 9 that morning, a ship forward flap arrived in the ring yard from between High Bay and Mega Bay 1. In short order, the flap was offloaded from the trailer and then taken into Star Factory. Back at the launch site, crews were seen rigging up a crane to one of the recently delivered subcoolers. However, apparently there was an issue and the lift was aborted and the crane disconnected. 
Around that same time, following the earlier blowdown, the booster quick disconnect was retracted and the hood closed. That afternoon, crews continued to install the windows on the facade of the under construction star factory to office connector. At the launch complex, the crane was once again connected to one of the new subcoolers. The workers seemed pleased with the setup this time, and it was then lifted and installed on the near end of the tank farm. Later that afternoon, a scrapped piece of the old first-generation booster transport stand that was, until recently, holding Booster 4's aft section, departed Starbase on a flatbed truck. And just minutes later, the SPMT that brought the subcooler departed the launch complex and headed up the highway towards the build site. A few hours later, a crate was lifted out of the center of the launch mount as crews continued to prepare for the arrival of Booster 13. Meanwhile, the two bridge cranes in the Mega Bay 1 tandem lifted Booster 13 off the work stand in the back right corner of the building. That booster then became the first Super Heavy to be placed onto the new transport stand. Several water pumps arrived at the launch site on a flatbed trailer. It seems likely that these will be used to keep the trench area free of standing water as crews continue to build out the infrastructure at that location. By that evening, the new subcooler had been secured into its place in the tank farm and crews disconnected it from the crane. First thing on Tuesday morning, an empty ring stand was moved out of Mega Bay 2 and back over to Star Factory, having successfully delivered Ship 34's common dome section for stacking. Around that same time, down at the launch site, a large white mystery container was delivered. A short time later, the container was taken back out onto Highway 4 and down to the D1 gate. Throughout that morning, Rover 3 caught several crates being lifted in and out of the center of the launch mount as crews worked to wrap up refurbishment work in preparation for the arrival of Booster 13. At that same time, the Flight 6 Super Heavy was being moved out of Mega Bay 1. Once the rocket had cleared the building's doorframe, it stopped and its grid fins were rotated back to their neutral position. The glass crew was making good progress on the Star Factory to office connector, with the row of windows now extending almost a third of the way across the most recent addition to the facilities. Around 9.30, the mystery container made yet another appearance as it was taken out of the D1 gate and once again taken into the D2 gate. It's not clear if anything was taken out of the crate while it was at the far end of the tank farm or why it was down there. A half hour later, the container was then lifted off the delivery truck and set down on the near end of the tank farm. Later that morning, crews were spotted placing cones along Highway 4 outside the launch complex in anticipation of the rollout of Booster 13. Also in preparation for the rocket's pending arrival, the chopsticks were raised partway up the tower and opened slightly. Meanwhile, another delivery arrived at the D2 gate. This time, the flatbed was carrying a pair of small vertical tanks, as well as a large tarped cover package. And just before noon, LabCam was able to catch the crane on the HOS Ridgewind as it worked just offshore to fish the Flight 5 hot stage adapter out of the Gulf of Mexico. Then, as SpaceX's noon rolling closure began, Booster 13 was brought out of the build site and began rolling down Highway 4. Now loaded with 33 Raptors, the Flight 6 first stage was brought to the launch site just nine days after Megazilla successfully caught its predecessor. And a few hours later, the Super Heavy, which was initially parked at the end of the chopsticks, was shifted back towards the arm's lifting points. Meanwhile, work continued on Tower 2, and SpaceX's large crane could be seen using its smaller auxiliary hook to lift supplies or equipment up to the waiting workers. Around that same time, a large heavy-duty looking black box was brought out of the D1 gate and taken up the road towards the build site. About 15 minutes before 4 o'clock that afternoon, the chopsticks were raised to Booster 13's hard points as SpaceX moved into final lift preparations. And about a half an hour later, the ship quick disconnect arm was swung out away from the launch tower. Early that evening, the large white container that was delivered earlier was lifted again. The container now had some HVAC equipment installed on its roof and was moved between the last two horizontal tanks in the farm. At 7 p.m. that evening, Mechazilla lifted Booster 13 off its transport stand briefly before lowering it back down again. 
The two small white vertical tanks that arrived earlier in the day were lifted one after the other and installed near the area where the new white container had been placed. Finally, everything was ready and Booster 13 was raised into the air. The Super Heavy was then rotated over and slowly lowered onto the launch mount for the first time, just over a week after the mount had been vacated by Booster 12. About 45 minutes before midnight, the Booster Quick disconnect hood was open and the QD interface was extended and attached to Booster 13 for the first time. Later, the chopsticks released the rocket and were returned to their resting position off to the side at the bottom of the tower. On Wednesday morning, the LR-11000 was once again busy, utilizing its auxiliary hook to lift equipment to workers waiting on Tower 2. With Booster 13 now setting securely on the launch mount, the Super Heavy's new transport stand was moved across the launch pad to be stored during the upcoming static fire testing. As the test preparations continued, crews on the launch mount could be seen dismantling the scaffolding and loading it into a crate to be brought back down to the ground. That night, the launch mount work platform was lowered onto its waiting stand so it could be removed from the danger zone for the upcoming tests. Later, Booster 13 was observed venting as SpaceX performed some ambient pressure tests on the vehicle to ensure both the rocket and Stage Zero were ready for the static fire. Shortly before midnight, Rover 3 managed to catch some gimbal testing of the rocket's inner 13 Raptor engines. Thursday morning, over at the Sanchez site, construction of the new launch mount for Pad B continued. The large Grove crane was spotted moving pieces of the next iteration of the crucial hardware. Meanwhile, over at the parking garage, crews were seen breaking down the scaffolding that was used to give workers access for the finishing touches of the southeast corner of the structure. At the launch site, the legs of the orbital launch mount were being washed ahead of the planned static fire of Booster 13 later in the day. Shortly before noon, the stand for the launch mount work platform was moved back underneath the launch mount. The platform was raised overnight to allow access for final preparations and fixes ahead of the testing. Then, after a long day of waiting and a non-super chilled propellant loading test, the moment finally arrived. The deluge system kicked on and Booster 13 ignited its 33 Raptor engines in a successful static fire. Unbelievably, this test came less than 12 days after the incredibly successful launch of Flight 5 from this same pad. Switching over to Florida, on Friday afternoon, support ship Harvey Stone towed Blue Origin's Jacklin landing barge out of Port Canaveral, likely for additional sea trials ahead of New Glenn's first launch later this year. That night, Falcon 9 Booster 1076 lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 on its 17th mission. This Starlink launch was the second from the pad in less than four days as SpaceX looks to make up for lost time from their last pause while they investigated the issue with Crew 9's second stage deorbit burn. Saturday afternoon, a short fall of Gravitas was towed out to sea in support of booster recovery for the next Starlink mission. And several hours later, Go Cosmos returned to Port Canaveral, carrying the fairing halves from the Europa Clipper launch. For this fully expendable Falcon Heavy mission, the ship had needed to be traveling over 2,000 kilometers downrange to fish the reusable hardware from the ocean. Despite having just returned from such a distant mission, Go Cosmos headed back out to sea just three hours later. Instead of heading south to the landing zone for the next Starlink mission, the ship turned northward where Booster 1076 landed on Just Read the Instructions the day before. Sunday morning saw Doug's return to the Port Canaveral docks, carrying all four of the fairing halves from the Starlink Group 10-10 and Group 8-19 launches. Interestingly, just two hours later, Doug headed back out to sea after unloading just two of the fairing halves. With Go Cosmos having headed north, Doug needed to be on station for recovery operations for the Starlink Group 6 61 launch. On Tuesday morning, dockside processing was completed on Falcon 9 Booster 1080, and the rocket was laid into a transporter for its return to Roberts Road for refurbishment. Wednesday, just read the instructions was towed into the Port Canaveral docks, with Booster 1076 following its launch of the Starlink Group 8-19 mission.
About three hours later, the rocket was lifted off the drone ship and transferred to the dockside stand for processing. Late that afternoon, the Starlink Group 6-61 mission lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 and delivered another 23 satellites to orbit. In the early hours of Thursday morning, Go Cosmos returned to Port Canaveral. The substitute fairing recovery vessel had made a trip to the shipyards in Charleston where it apparently left SpaceX's small boat Maverick behind with Bob. That afternoon, Booster 1076's legs had been stowed. The rocket was then lifted off the dockside stand and transferred to an awaiting horizontal transporter. And several hours later, Just Read the Instructions was towed back out to sea again in support of the next Starlink mission. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, guys, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Lab Padre out.